A small factory of life floats in the immensity of the sea. Loaded with the power of photosynthetic pigments, this mangrove seed faces a long journey across the great blue, crossing entire oceans in its quest to conquer new lands in which to sow the seeds of life. The story begins with this small, fertile traveler and its arrival in the Cuban archipelago, a land of still undiscovered nature, eclipsed by the beauty of its coral sea. Like this one, other mangroves too came from distant lands and created a fascinating little-known world, a jungle half above ground, half beneath water an impenetrable maze where countless animals find refuge, the mangrove forest. Inside this strange world, life survives between extremes. There are excesses of salt, of humidity and of heat, and every day it goes from droughts to floods, dictated by the tides. The fauna that has colonized it has had to overcome countless obstacles and that has made it very much like the mangrove kingdom itself. Just as rich, as unknown and as dangerous. In this impossible world, a surprise lurks around every corner. Every animal is an enigma and every shadow a potential danger. This complex labyrinth is the legacy of that intrepid seed which came across the immensity of the ocean. A fascinating paradise where life has remained untouched by man. The coral world surrounds the Cuban archipelago. Enormous coral structures, the result of thousands of years of patient calcareous construction, constitute the reefs which fill the coasts of Cuba with life. It is not a sea rich in nutrients, but protected by the corals, life multiplies in an explosion of biodiversity. The coral reef is composed of millions of tiny filtering polyps capable of turning the solar energy and the scarce nutrients in the water into organic material available for other organisms in the coral community. Starting with them, the chain becomes increasingly complex and thousands of different life forms develop from the fragile invertebrates to the most highly evolved complex fish. The tiny coral polyps join forces with the microscopic photosynthetic algae which enable them to generate the external skeletons of calcium carbonate. When the polyps die, their skeletons remain, and on them settle millions of new polyps creating layer upon layer, and so over countless generations, the coral reef is slowly constructed. In this calcareous world, each one occupies its own particular niche, and its role affects the rest of the community. It is not easy to find food in the world of the reef, and the only way to survive is to specialize.
For these little irasses picking about the skin of a moray eel, the solution meant an obvious risk, but they found their place by becoming cleaners of other fish. Despite their small size, the irasses do not fear any of the fish in the reef. They all need them to remove the pesky parasites and impurities from their skin. So the different cleaner irasses have permission to approach and touch the bodies of one of them, even the most ferocious looking ones like this green moray. Gigantic coral structures that form the barrier reef also perform a protective function of enormous value for life. Like a natural breakwater, the coral skeletons slow down the impetuous sea breaking the waves. This gives rise to a strip of calm sea waters which extends from the reef to the beaches of the different Cuban islands. And here, between tranquility and turbulence, a number of factors come together, making the life of the mangrove possible. The coastal side of the barrier reef is a world of permanent peace. The water is clear and shallow, and marine currents that gently filter through deposit the crushed remains of shells and corals, forming a bed of white sand. With good visibility and clear seabeds, many of the inhabitants of this strip choose camouflage to blend in with the sand and so hide from predators and remain invisible to potential prey. Others, like the rays and the stingrays, prefer to bury themselves and wait for their prey beneath the sandy bottom, only their eyes peeking out. As we approach the coast, we come to our traveling seed's final destination, the main island of Cuba. Here, the seawater mixes with the fresh water of the rivers flowing from the interior of the island. With this mixture, there is an increase in nutrients and, in consequence, thousands of fish and invertebrates concentrate close to the surface. Finally, we come to the mangrove kingdom, the place where other traveling seeds struck land. It is the end of the journey of our seed and the beginning of our journey around one of the least known and most fascinating ecosystems in Cuba, the mangrove swamp. Though it is a coastal ecosystem, the substratum of the mangroves has its origins in the interior of the island. The dense jungles that cover the high regions of the interior retain the rainwater. This water gradually filters through the lateric soil of the jungles and forms rivers that descend and grow until they reach the sea. The water that fell in the highlands erodes the land surface carrying minerals and organic matter in suspension, and when it reaches the coast, the contact with the salt of the seawater causes sedimentation of this silt rich in nutrients. It is a strange, sinister world.
the silt condensers forming a viscous mud, corrosively acid due to the lack of oxygen. Strange forms emerge from the aquatic half-light. There is little light due to the suspended particles and a growing salinity which changes with the tides. But it is here, where conditions would appear to be precisely the opposite of those needed for life, that the different types of mangroves settle and grow. To anchor themselves to this poisonous bed, the mangroves have developed special roots. A horizontal binding system which turns the mangrove swamp into an impenetrable labyrinth. These extraordinary roots manage to extract the nutrients from the surface layer of the mud while the intricate interweaving retains the silt coming from inland, preventing it from being carried out to sea with the tide. To achieve this miracle in a fatally toxic substratum, the aerial roots of the mangroves either have spongy tissue which absorbs oxygen from the air, or they generate roots which rise up from the bottom like snorkels till they emerge above the surface of the water. The result is that any seed deposited in these noxious muds rapidly germinate, and the mangrove forest grows inexorably, progressively gaining ground on the sea. At the surface, the mangrove swamp is a jungle of survivors. Few vegetable species can cope with the restrictions of this saline substratum lacking in oxygen, but those that can rapidly proliferate and provide shelter for a complex zoological community. For the Hutias, the tops of the mangroves are an exhaustible larder. In Cuba, there are ten different species, and one of them is this, the Damarest Hutia or Conga Hutia, the largest of all. Generally, the Hutias are nocturnal, but here in the mangrove swamps of the north of the island, they spend the daylight hours hidden among the mangroves, eating leaves, bark, fruits, and even the occasional small lizard. Like all inhabitants of the mangrove forest, the Hutias remain permanently on guard. No one is safe in this shadowy maze. Down in the water lurk terrible crocodiles, while among the branches and roots of the mangrove labyrinth, there are boas that eat hutias. So, at the slightest movement, they immediately go on the alert and flee in search of refuge. The mangrove forest offers great advantages to many birds, especially those that feed on fish. In a world surrounded by water, the mangroves provide vantage points where they can nest without fearing the land predators. And all around there are fish, invertebrates and small reptiles with which to feed their chicks. So when the breeding season comes round, the mangroves are adorned with an infinite variety of nests.
For the American Jabidos, the mangrove boughs are impregnable fortresses in which to guard their chicks. Here there are no predators and food can always be found. So of each clutch of eggs they lay, more chicks survive than in continental colonies. In an apparent paradox, this ecosystem, which would appear at the very limit of the ecologically conceivable, is now being revealed as a rich, diverse world where animals and plants develop in their thousands, free from the usual interference from man. This is an intermediate world created by both, between the waters of the sea and those of the rivers. A hybrid world which requires major osmotic adaptions, but in compensation offers almost inexhaustible food and shelter. The mixture of fresh water laden with new nutrients and the salt water that gives rise to sedimentation favors the increase of the invertebrates and fish, and this makes the austere wetlands and coves of the mangrove forest a meeting place for thousands of aquatic birds that come here each day to partake of the feast. In the waters of the Cuban Keys and islands where the mangrove grows, over a hundred different bird species can be found, the majority equipped with long legs for wading. Each species has a beak specialized in catching a certain type of prey, so competition among them was reduced to the minimum. This one, the brown pelican, the only strictly marine pelican, uses the technique of swooping down to catch fish from the air. Others are much more sophisticated and have prodigious beaks which are the result of millions of years of adaptations in order to filter the water. No other beak in the mangrove swamp can compare with that of the flamingos. Attracted by the microscopic crustaceans that proliferate in the brackish waters, thousands of them come to the mangrove swamps. Their strange beaks are equipped with sieves that filter the water and retain the tiny crustaceans, and their stilt-like legs and webbed feet mean they can walk easily across the viscous slime. Just a few decades ago, flamingos were very numerous in Cuba, but humans have destroyed the majority of their breeding colonies, and the last specimens today hide in the mangrove forests of the main island, where inaccessibility has become their greatest ally. At twilight, great flocks of birds disturb the reigning peace at the edge of the mangrove forests. The outer edge of this inhospitable ecosystem where the aquatic birds gather to eat is the best known and most tumultuous region of the mangrove forest. It is an open, exposed area where the birds can be easily seen and so at first it was believed that the majority of the wildlife was concentrated here.
But the impenetrable interior of the mangrove labyrinth hides shy, fascinating surprises. Cuba, like the rest of the Antilles, is a land dominated by lizards. Among the aerial roots, the shoots and the tops of the mangrove forest, thousands of them divide up the territory, marking it out and defending it with signals peculiar to each species. Each layer has its species, each individual its territory, each tree its owner. The Anolis are the most widespread genus with the greatest number of different species. On a high branch, a green Anolis lizard remains motionless, observing a ground lizard of the Leocephalus variety. The majority of species imitate the surroundings in which they live. Camouflage is vital to survival. Those that live on the branches and trunks are of brownish colors. Those that colonize the leaves are generally green, and those that live on the ground mimic the color of the dry leaves and the grasses. In the mangrove forest, only the movement of their courtships or a skin which has been shed and left behind makes them detectable. And there's a very good reason why. Though the water is a barrier for many land animals, some Cuban hunters are good swimmers. Of the 26 species of snake that live in Cuba, none is poisonous, but some, like the Cuban boa of this Alsophis, almost two meters in length, are sufficiently strong enough to catch and devour lizards, birds, and even rodents. The mangrove's success in colonizing is due both to its extraordinary evolutionary adaptations making it possible to live in an acid, briny environment and to its incredible method of reproduction. When the mangroves reproduce, they develop what will be the most astonishing means of genetic expansion. Colonizers equipped to travel vast distances, their seeds. The mangrove seeds germinate when they are still on the branches. They are shaped like arrows and that is their first tactic. When they are sufficiently developed, they fall from the tree and the sharp tip often sticks into the mud. In that way, a new tree has been planted and can begin to grow. Tiny roots will now emerge from the bottom, and from the top they shoot in the leaves. Little by little these new descendants grow, and the mangrove forest slowly advances into the sea. But on other occasions the seeds fall at high tide, and never gain a foothold in the muddy bottom. When these travelers reach the open sea, the stronger upward push of the salt water makes them float horizontally, and their green photosynthetic cells provide them with food. In this way, they can survive floating for a whole year, and so colonize other islands, other countries, or even other continents.
Despite the concentrations of birds of the estuaries and the life hidden inside the dense interior, a place where the mangrove forest demonstrates its greatest biological richness is in the shadowy world of its submerged roots. Each day, the spectral world receives fresh supplies of nutrients from the rivers and the rising tides. Thus, there is constant renewal of resources in the shadowy maze of acidic muds and variable salinity, so the animals that have managed to adapt to the physical conditions proliferate in their thousands. Even apparently sterile corners teem with life. The filtering organisms such as the sea squirts, anemones, sponges and mollusks climb to the smooth roots and cover them, giving them a baroque appearance. Like many other crustaceans, this spider crab of the Macropodia genus takes advantage of the microscopic food brought by the current. Like it, thousands of tiny young fish eat their fill. The submerged world of the mangrove forest not only offers them constant food, but also provides them with protection, enabling them to rapidly seek refuge among the intricate network of holes, pores and hollows formed by the roots. The bottoms of many of the channels of the mangrove swamp appear to be covered in strange, luxuriant plant life. Thousands of jellyfish turn over and rest with their tentacles reaching up towards the surface, filtering the water, converted into luxuriant plants of an intermediate kingdom, a living mirage in the already strange and fascinating cosmos of the mangrove forest. Down here, things take on unusual forms. Even the fish look like something quite different. The mud and the roots are the world of the batfish. Imitating the bottom, it hardly needs to swim and walks on its transformed fins, simulating an amphibian being, straight from the imagination of H.P. Lovecraft. In the minimalist world of the mangrove forest, there are also giants. Up to four meters long and weighing almost 600 kilos, the manatees are the largest mammals in the mangrove forest. Its vegetarian diet explains its nickname, the sea cow, a name which also reflects its docile character. Because in spite of their size, the manatees are pacific animals, and that in the mangrove forest is very unusual. The world of the Cuban mangrove also has its demons. This is the Cuban crocodile, an armored-clad survivor from prehistoric times, an endemism of Cuban waters and the most merciless hunter in the mangrove forest. Both 
both in and out of the water, there are fearsome armor-plated hunters, and not just crocodiles. Because beneath the water, the mangrove swamps of Cuba conceal a fish of which it is said that it has the mouth, the skin, and the soul of a crocodile. Lurking among the roots, a manjuari, a fish from a line which reached its zenith during the Mesozoic era, waits immobile for unsuspecting prey to come by. Its large toothed mouth, its primitive fins, and its armor-plated body make it a formidable predator. So formidable, in fact, that the majuari or alligator gar, as it is also known, is feared even by young crocodiles. But when Cuban crocodiles reach adulthood, no one except man poses a threat to them. In their domains, all other living beings are their prey. Fish, amphibians and reptiles, birds and mammals. The Cuban crocodile makes no distinctions. It is an expert hunter and for it, any movement means an invitation to hunt. Jacanos and egrets search for small prey just a short distance from a crocodile. While they have him in sight, the birds are unafraid. In a direct attack, they would simply fly off with no problem. But when one of these saurians submerges, it's a different matter entirely, and so it's best to make good your escape. Today, Cuban crocodiles are found only in two small areas, the Zapata marshes in the southwest of the main island and the Lanier marshes on the island of Juventud, and that makes them the crocodiles with the most restricted distribution on the planet. Here in Zapata, the breeding season has arrived and the adults gather together marking the dominant hierarchy with their raised tails and open jaws in an impressive display of strength. These displays will decide the order and the right to mate, and no male will give in easily. With several animals together in the same pool, conflicts between them are inevitable. The threatening mating postures don't normally have further consequences, but if one of the crocodiles manages to hunt down some prey, the tension of the courtships is compounded by the natural predatory aggressiveness, and war is unleashed among the dragons. Combats are spectacular, major wounds are a rare occurrence. After a few sporadic confrontations, it is clear who is the dominant male. 
Now the pool has its king, and the monarch imposes his rules. After the combats, the victorious male joins a receptive female. She tempers his aggressiveness by raising her snout as a sign of submission. Until she manages to calm him down, the excited male could even attack her. When the male and the female have accepted each other, the courtship, reminiscent of a dance, begins. Then the female dives down, expelling air through her mouth and nose, and the male mounts her in a long copulation, which can last for up to 15 minutes. For land animals, life in the Cuban mangrove forest is not easy, and even less if you can't fly, and have just brought into the world a litter of tiny, inexpert rodents. To keep its young safe, this jutia seeks the protection of the maze of corridors of a dry mango trunk. Even when she breastfeeds her litter, she remains on the alert, thanks to the lateral positioning of her nipples. In the mangrove forest, lowering your guard for even an instant can mean death. And though the crocodiles, her worst enemies, can't reach her here, the jutias have other predators, and the Cuban boa, or maja, is one of the most fearsome. While her young are feeding, the Hutia remains motionless, concentrating, alert to any sign of potential danger. Guided by its olfactory tongue, the serpent locates the den and changes course. It knows that if it can surprise the litter, it will easily be able to catch one of the young. But luckily, Mother Hutia also has an excellent sense of smell and from the entrance to the burrow, she can detect the slight movement of the passing snake. The Khutia waits, not wanting to abandon the refuge unnecessarily if the snake is simply passing by. Unfortunately for her, the boa remains fixed on its objective. With an infinitely flexible body, the intricate trunk represents no obstacle for the snake. But as soon as it enters through one of the holes, the Hutia leads her children out through the emergency exit, and the family makes good its escape. Shortly afterwards, when the boa reaches their lair, all that remains is the musky smell of the rodent's fear and nervousness. For the hutias of the mangrove forest, moving across the ground represents a constant risk. They are perfectly able to climb, run or swim, but the waters of Sabata always contain vigilant eyes. And even when you feel you are safe, Death might be right behind you, ready to pounce.
Exhausted after swimming across a pool, this Hothia is resting on a trunk, celebrating the fact she has evaded all the dangers of the water. From the pool come the sounds of her worst enemies, but on land she's faster, and she seems to be rather overconfident as she gets her breath back. Every time she turns her back to the water, the dragons go on the alert. And silently, stealthily, death approaches. Luckily, she still has strength for one final leap, and on the safety of solid ground, the intrepid Hutia moves off, denying the voracious Cuban crocodile a prey he was sure was his. In the interior of the island, where the mangrove forest seems most impenetrable, the rocks are pierced by deep caverns that lead to the sea. These hidden, submerged caverns, unsuspected worlds where time appears to have stood still, are the home of one of the most fascinating and unknown creatures of the Cuban mangrove forest, the blind fish of the Cubanictus genus. Virtually nothing is known about them. Over many thousands of years, their world of perpetual darkness has gradually robbed them of their pigments and their vision. They are now white shadows in a black world, relics of a nocturnal marine ancestor who, equipped with wings, was able to cope with the osmotic changes of increasingly fresh water and set off to explore these flooded caves. Propelled by elegant undulations of its continuous dorsal and ventral fins, these Cubanictes swim with the tranquility that comes from knowing you live in an exclusive world where there are no predators, alert for signals indicating the presence of the freshwater shrimps on which they feed. At present, there are four known species of Cuban blindfish, but in-depth studies have yet to be carried out. How were they able to adapt to the radical changes between two worlds so completely different as the dark freshwater caves and the bright marine world of the reef? Who was the pioneer from the corals that set out on the evolutionary adventure that led to these ghosts of the caverns? Like so many other questions, the answers remain hidden, concealed in the mysterious labyrinth of the impenetrable mangrove forest. Every year, the seasonal rains flood the Zapata marshes. The inland lagoons multiply and the birds arrive to nest, the migratory species joining the local ones. This is a time of abundance, and the mangrove forest comes to life with the movement of the many different species searching for food. Hummingbirds and orioles fly among the flowers, looking for nectars and insects. While in the open, recently flooded areas, there is a veritable explosion of life. Millions of small invertebrates proliferate among the floating vegetation. The larvae attract the fish, and these, the egrets, cormorants, and storks.
With the rains and the water, millions of mosquitoes are born. But the majority of them never reach adulthood as they are trapped by these specialists walking across the water layers and aquatic plants. The long toes of the Ijekanas enable them to reach anywhere where there is a floating plant. Light and precise, they lift up the vegetation and catch the invertebrates that live below. The American purple Gananul also uses this same technique, though in this case instead of an invertebrate, it is going to find a surprise. With the increase in available fish, the double-crested cormorants get ready to breed. These cormorants are normally migratory, but the subspecies Floridanus, which lives in southern Florida, and the Cuban archipelago has become sedentary, perhaps because of the year-round abundance of the mango forests. During the mating season, the double-crested cormorants gather in colonies which can contain thousands of couples and build their nests on the ground or in the branches of the different trees of the marshes. The need to find a mate and the concentration of so many cormorants in the areas chosen to build their nests mean there are sometimes fights between neighbors, but these never go further than frantic beating of wings and a shriek or two. On this occasion, the dispute is soon over. Their splashing around has attracted dark shadows beneath the water and the cormorants have learned to respect the sharks that swim in the estuaries. An even larger shadow appears in the clear waters. A manatee is exploring the newly flooded areas in search of weeds and pasture to calm its insatiable appetite. Propelled forward by its rear extremities converted into a wide flat fin, the manatee advances escorted by a permanent army of fish that feed on the sediments stirred up by the mammal and the algae and parasites that cover its body. Every day, a manatee must eat vegetable matter equivalent to one-tenth its body weight, that is, between 40 and 70 kilos, the equivalent of eating 200 lettuces a day. Its incessant feeding activity is good for the mangrove forest because it clears the water channels which otherwise would be overrun by vegetation in just a few months. These peaceful sirenias spend their lives in the water, periodically coming out to breathe. It was during one of these pauses for breath that in 1492 Christopher Columbus spotted them, the first ever mention of the species, and confused them with the mermaids described by Herodotus. Today the mermaids are disappearing. In the entire West Indies, including Cuba, there remain no more than 2,500, and unfortunately, each year, this number falls further. The Cuban mangrove forest is still an unknown world concealing biological mysteries and treasures which will astonish the world. A forgotten paradise ruled over by an impenetrable hell of marshy labyrinths, myriads of mosquitoes, and dangerous crocodiles. 
Science has not yet studied the complexity of its creatures and the balance of its ecosystems. And that is part of the charm of the Cuban mangrove forest, knowing that it remains exactly as it always has been, impenetrable, solitary, virgin. It is such a complex world that virtually nothing is known about it. And nonetheless, all its strength and complexity, all its biodiversity and richness, are due to tiny intrepid travelers that still today, faithful to their spirit, continue to set out on anonymous journeys, crossing the sea and sowing the seeds of paradise. <laughs>